I'm sorry. Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good night. What a great beginning to World Ocean Week. I'm Maria Pena from the Center for Resource Management and Environmental Studies at the University of the West Indies, Cave Hill Campus in Barbados. And with me today are colleagues Amina Desai, Sanya Compton, Mia Clark, and Patrick McConney, our director. We are happy to welcome you to our lively session on Caribbean fisher folk lives and livelihood interactions. I hope you see what I've done there. Our session is linked to three regional Surmese areas of work and focus areas for the International Year of Fisheries and Aquaculture, IAFA 2022. These are the Gender and Fisheries Team and two FAO implemented projects. Um, Stuart Fish and the SSF Gender Project. We have a two-part show for you. Part one will be run by Amina and I, with Mia driving the videos, and part two by Sanya and Patrick. In the first part of the session, women and men fisher folk from the Caribbean will welcome you into their houses, their various operational sites, through videos to share their daily lives with you. So for a while, their house is your house. I want to point out that we encourage fisher folk to do their own video productions using their devices for authenticity. So much of what you're about to see has been done by them with assistance at times from friends. Part two looks more closely at how other sectors of the blue and green economy interact and impact the lives and livelihoods of these Caribbean fisher folk with multiple consequences. National intersectoral coordination mechanisms and principles of good governance are key to this discussion. But we let Sonia and Patrick tell you more about that. A special welcome to some of our fisher folk who may be with us. I can't see all of the participants right now but we possibly have Terrell, Inga, and David from Jamaica, as well as Shalene. We also are expecting Winsbert from St. Vincent and Sylvia from Barbados, as well as Sodat and Ronald from Guyana and Rabani. So a couple of Zoom instructions. Zoom is now ubiquitous. We've all been using it for our various meetings and webinars, but right now everyone is muted to ask questions, it's best that you drop those questions in the bottom and using the Q&A feature, or you can add them to the chat if you wish. This session has no interpretation and will only be conducted in English. So let's get started with part one. The show starts in Jamaica with three young fisher folk. Meet Terrell Gohagen, Inga Wilson, and David Thomas Jr. Terrell is a member of the Lessons Fisher Folk Group in St. Thomas. He fishes with other young men of this group on both the South Shelf and the offshore bank at Pedro Keys and Morant Bank. These young men have made a conscious decision to be independent and have chosen fishing as their main source of income. He has been in the industry for over eight years and prefers diving. Terrell is also involved in the harvesting of conch, one of the main economically important fisheries of Jamaica. He's currently in the process of exploring other underutilized fisheries, such as for Irish moss, which will increase his source of income for his self and his family. He is a fan and supporter of fish sanctuaries, especially the nearby Bowden Fish Sanctuary, having seen the positive impacts they have on fish size and quantity. Inga, is an interim president of the Paji Fisher Folk Group and is one of the few and youngest women at the age of 28 years old, holding a board position in a fisher folk organization in the region. This energetic and eloquent young lady wants to make a difference in the fishing industry in Jamaica. She is currently in the process of creating and registering a fisher folk cooperative that will benefit the fishing village and surrounding communities by providing opportunities for women and men. She is a licensed fisherwoman, vendor, and business owner of her Cabarita pop-up shop. David Jr. is a member of the Morant Bay Fisherfolk Group in St. Thomas. 
David is one of the few young men, uh, 41 years old, of this mature group of fisher folk who has been consistent in his membership and wants to make a difference in the fishing industry in Jamaica. He is currently in the process of purchasing his own boat and hopes to expand his reach of customers within the fishing village and surrounding communities by providing fresh fish. He is a proponent of social protection of, for fisher folk, and he appreciates the steps the government of Jamaica is taking to provide health and life insurance to his colleagues. Do enjoy this first video. I'm Shelley Berry, Fisheries Officer of the National Fisheries Authority in Jamaica. The videos being highlighted today represents small-scale fishers across the island who have contributed significantly to the Jamaican economy by providing food security to our nationals. I am a material and I'm from Lyce in St. Thomas and I've been fishing in for eight years now. Hello everyone, my name is Inga Fee Wilson, um, more popularly known as Inga. I am a licensed fisherwoman as well as a fish vendor and a business owner. I am David Thomas, Inga, from uh, the fishing beach in St. Thomas, Jamaica. I've been fishing here on the South Shelf in the area for over 20 years. I'm a part of the Marathi fishing center. And I mostly do diving, like the show lines and them things. Yes. But diving, I have a passion for diving. You no, know, and I mostly shoot like snappers and parrot, barracuda. I fish in Pat net online a catch para doctor snapper jack I go to sea three times per week and I fish in on ten fathom of water to on to one hundred. I would hope that I'll be able to take you guys on the journey on how, on how I actually obtain the fish for my other business, which is the fresh fish vendor sale. I do sell fresh fish on the beach. Um, usually I'll be the one that most vendors would come to for fish, or I would say my-, my Amina, are you having a sinking problem? My home will be the yard that they come to for fish because we have the boats and the equipments and whatnot and the divers. I fish on the banks sometime to like Moran Key and Pijo Bank, those places. Right now I'm just in my hometown just, you know, these are some Irish marsh here I got cleaning out. From sea, I see the fishing vendors are waiting, so I serve them and then I pack up my fishing gears and venture back. All right, so currently we are in one of my businesses, the pop-up shop. Um, it's called the Cabarita pop-up shop and it's a shop and a cook shop at the same time. I like the way of the sanctuaries and everything, they keep things growing, you know, because even up my side, up this Port Moran side, since the sanctuary has been active, there's a lot of changes been going on. Fisher folks in Jamaica have been left behind concerning insurance and these things. I see the government taking a step to implement uh, a insurance that covers health and life and for fisher folks and their families.
Maria, I believe you need to. Sorry. There you are. So now we're moving south to St. Vincent, where we meet Winsbert Harry, a true fisher folk leader, holding leadership posts as the president of the National Fisher Folk Cooperative and vice chair of the Caribbean Network of Fisher Folk Organizations. Winsbert highlights the risky nature of a fisherman's life through personal experiences. You, the audience, will experience the impact of the recent eruption of the Lassifera volcano on fisher folk livelihoods. His is a story of the selflessness of fisher folk in his island and his recent traumatic experience bringing relief supplies to fellow fisher folk um, donated from neighboring St. Lucia fisher folk. Despite his experiences, fishing is in his blood and he says he will always be a fisherman. Do enjoy. Hello, good morning each and everyone. My name is Winsport Harry. I'm a fisherman from St. Vincent and the Grenadines. I'm the president of the National Fisher Folks Cooperative in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. I'm also the vice chairman of the Caribbean Network of Fisher Folks Organization, the CNFO. I'm a fisherman by profession. As we celebrate World Ocean Day, I'm very thankful to the forum to welcoming me and to inviting me to share my knowledge as a fisherman. Life at sea with Winsworth Harry was not an easy one and my hope for the future as a fisherman is real ups and down. But the fishing industry contributes to the food security of the whole world and it contributes to the GDP of the economy of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Life at sea it's not easy at all, because being a fisherman, you take a tremendous risk of your life going out in the morning and return at evening the way we fish in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Fisher folks in the red zone is very deeply impacted. Up to today, they are not known when and how will they will apply their trade and go back home to their own home that was destroyed from the last over ashes and from the volcano. Today we are still having an active volcano and fish folks in those zones were asked not to go back in those zones yet. So as the president, I <clears throat> reached out to my regional organization and sent Lucia Fisherman's Cooperative, the Goodwill Fisherman's Cooperative, to assist. I journey across to St. Lucia on April 16 to collect relief supply to see how best I could assist my members and fisher folks in the red zone with food and water. We journey to St. Lucia where we <clears throat> collect relief supply, but on our, back, on our way back home, Winsbeth Harry encounter another difficulty again. Our boat was sink with all our relief supply. After swimming for three and a half hours in the ocean for my life, we was rescued by three St. Lucian fishermen who then take us back to the v Fort port in St. Lucia. I encountered several multiple serious burns on my skin. I had to seek medical um, attention that I had to spend almost a day and some into the hospital. Um, the captain of the boat, Sunrise Sunshine Angel, he lost the boat and we lost the engine. We lost all our equipment and we lost all the, uh, everything that we had. It was a tremendous effort for me as a fisherman and as a president of the National Fisher Folks to see how best I could assist and to reach out to my suffering brothers who had to leave their homes and leave their families behind to accept a new home into shelters. So with this, I would like to thank each and everyone sharing my story as a young fisherman. And I will say again that fishing is a very serious high risk and tremendous Commends to all my tragedies and my troubles I face at sea. I will still continue to fish.
100 miles to the east of St. Vincent, we stop in Barbados now for a visit with Sylvia White, the Vice President of the Barbados National Union of Fisherfolk Organizations, commonly referred to as Barnupo, and a member of the Central Fish Processors Association, the CFPA. The CFPA is the only post-harvest fisherfolk association in Barbados comprising of small-scale fish processors. It is, it is woman-led and it's an all-woman organization. These women have access to prime real estate within the Bridgetown Fisheries Complex, the Boning Hall. Appropriate attire though is required, so all hair must be covered and you must also be wearing clean aprons and boots to access. Join Sylvia for a tour of the complex in Boning Hall and share in her typical work day. Her love for the fishing industry is true and is grounded in family tradition and her 28 years in the fishing industry. Sylvia shares with us the changes she has seen in the Barbados fishing industry over the years. Enjoy. My name is Sylvia White and I'm Vice President of Barbados National Union of Fisher Forts Organizations and a member of the Central Fish Processing Association. I was in the fishing industry for the past 28 years, playing my trade at the Bridgetown Fishing Complex, which is now uh, part of the Ministry of Maritime uh, um, Affairs and the Blue Economy. My love for the fishing industry started at a very tender age where my parents and grandparents were all fisher folk, and I would always be around Temp Bay, around them, helping and, you know, being at the beach. And that's where my love for the fishing industry started. But it's a case now where you have to make a trip from the eastern side to the western side, uh, which has the bigger fish market and the biggest landing site on the island. Welcome to the Bridgetown Fishing Complex. I come take a look at the process of the day. Market where all the processing, the biggest market on the island, Barbados, where all the processing is, most of the processing is done. There are other markets around in different districts of the island, different landing sites. You have um, across the 12 parishes. Well, only 10 parishes have, have landing sites, but um, this is the biggest one on the island. This is the offloading area um, where all the boats are docked and the activity starts where people get in their fish and stuff. This is where we come and buy um, the flying fish that I normally work with and um, process them for customers on a daily basis. This is the processor how they operate and this is how our daily operations start and go with all the ladies. It's not as busy as normal today, um, unfortunately, but then things are up and running and busy. This is how over the years, the fishing industry has grown tremendously and, you know, the wealth of the fisher folk has grown. But recently, with all the climate change and everything that's going on with, you know, the fishing industry itself and marine biology, um, the, 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 the fish catches has, has, has dropped tremendously and it has become a strain on the, the fish for and the industry itself. Uh, we still try to provide um, a good quality product. Um, we still s get the opportunity to ship fish, but doing that has the cost of grown tremendous, um, you know, fuel prices has gone up, f um, equipment for the vessels have, you know, skyrocketed and, you know, everything is, is up in the air, but people still try to, and um, play the trade. Part one of our show wraps up with a visit with Sudat Prasad and Ronald Arjun, two aquaculture farmers and members of the East Burbies Quarantine Aquaculture Association in Guyana. 
Cumulatively, they have spent 60 years in the aquaculture sector. These two gentlemen provide a thorough account of aquaculture production of brackish water shrimp in Guyana while touring Ronald's farm. Learn how aquaculture production has been impacted over time by climate change and how they're adapting to the impacts of this phenomenon on the sector. My name is Sibra Passad, and I am an aquaculture farmer for the past 30 years. And I'm also the secretary of the East Barbies Aquaculture Association, which was established about five years ago. Mr. Ronald Arjun is a founder member of the Aquaculture Association, and he is currently the head of the committee member of the association. My name is Ronald Arjun. I am the owner of this farm. I own and operate this farm for the past 30 years. Our main production is brackish water shrimp. We also depend upon the highest spring, the highest tide, because the amount of water we have to get to dock the entire farm so the post larvae can be able to have enough water to survive and grow. And that is how we depend upon the, the entire spring, from the beginning of the spring until the height of the spring. Majority of these farms are owned and controlled by men, but there are a few farms that is being owned and controlled by women. Female partic participants in the aquaculture sector is responsible for the vending and processing of shrimp. The daily activities starts about 2 a.m. and during that time harvesting is being done up to 5 a.m. Between 5 a.m. to 6 a.m. the products is being sorted out and packed into containers ready for the market. Over the years I have observed a lot of difference in this water temperature, pH, and salinity, and I think it is all because of climate change. Another key impact of climate change, especially during the El Nino weather, is the rise of the temperature of the sea water. And that affects the intake of larvae and then when the water gets in the farm by the inlet, there is also excess heat during that period. And one of the way to combat or cushion the impact of that impact is to empolder the dams higher that it can accumulate uh, extra volume of water to reduce the temperature. And then another alternative is to access fresh water that can help to re reduce the heat. This farm depends solely on the Atlantic Ocean where we have our drainage and irrigation. Uh, the irrigation we depend upon for our post larvae to come into the farm and we keep it for about six to eight weeks which it reach a marketable size. Then we harvest and we take it to the market for sales. The aquaculture sector has a great potential if the relevant resources is given to the members of the association. And that will boost production and also improve life. Hello, everyone. So everyone, that's the end of part one of our show. I really do hope you enjoyed those videos. I enjoyed when those video clips came in to us, um, just get catching a glimpse of everyone's daily lives and, and daily use patterns, um, complete with background noise, birds, wind. I think it's just totally organic and authentic. So thank you for staying with us for part one. Now we're on to part two, another exciting part of our session. And I'm going to turn you over to Sonia and Patrick, over to you.
Thank you, Maria. This is one of these rare moments in which I've been more or less instructed I should turn on my video, although I'm going to revert to uh, the picture so as not to tempt uh, internet overload. In this part, we're going to connect to what you saw in the first part, but with a little twist. And um, that is, Sanya and I are going to look at how the lives and the livelihoods of folks in Caribbean small scale fisheries, especially marine capture fisheries, interact with other sectors. We all know, and in some of those videos we saw, that folks often have more than one livelihood and livelihoods are intertwined. They form networks of interactions. We're gonna look at that a little bit more closely. So I'm gonna see if everything is working here and I'm going to give you an intro to the topic and Sanya is going to give you a little bit more detail on how we see this as being part of what we call governance. So you should be seeing my screen and there we go. So we're going to talk about this for a while, um, followed by any questions you have on both parts one and two. We're also going to pay some attention to, to gender here and youth and other things, and you'll see why towards the end. So one of the answers uh, that you may want to know is what's the point of this particular part? Well, for those of you who are not from the Caribbean amongst our participants, both on YouTube and Zoom, small scale fisheries are important in many small islands, not only the Caribbean. Indeed, sometimes the Caribbean fisheries is seemingly less important because it's overshadowed by some of the other sectors we'll talk about. And small scale fisheries can be helped or hindered by those sectors. Livelihoods, lives, well being, health. There are many impacts that result from these interactions, some positive, some negative. And it's useful to pay attention to these. One of the things, and the main thing that Sandy is going to focus on, is how guidance on good and effective small-scale fisheries governance can help turn the positives even into better results and certainly address the negatives and um, turn them into positives as well. We call this improved national intersectoral coordination and it's urgently needed, particularly as some of those folks you saw even in the videos consider whether by natural hazards, whether by man-made interventions, whether by world economic conditions, they consider small-scale fisheries to be under threat. And it's important to address this. And next year in 2022, which is the International Year for Artisanal Fisheries and Aquaculture, we're gonna hopefully have in the Caribbean quite a large focus on intersectoral coordination at least in what CERMES is doing, and we'll share some of that with you. So let's dive right in to what we're talking about. Obvious to all of us in the Caribbean and in many other parts of the world is the fact that small scale fisheries seldom stand alone. Here in the Caribbean, in small islands, and on the coastal margins of large countries and continents, like Guyana we saw earlier, small-scale fisheries and even small-scale aquaculture interacts with many other sectors. Here we see images, for example, of tourism-related activities. Whether it is your fish fry that allows people from entire fishing households not only to harvest, but to process and then to sell to consumers uh, from hotels and from all parts of the country and all parts of the world, 
their product that is value added to earn even more income for the household. There's interaction of all types between cruise ship tourism, seen here on a small fishing harbor of fishing boats in Dominica. All types of interactions with tourism. Coastal management is important for both tourism and small scale fisheries. And even recreational or sport fisheries, charter fishing has a lot of importance. Whether it is at the species level, the targets of marlin and dolphin fish, or whether it is just catching bait. A short trip into some of the negatives and positives, in that often the near shore where small scale fishers operate is used for waste disposal. In some cases, we have in hurricane impacted countries, large scale devastation. Some would attribute this to extreme weather due to climate change and variability. But we do have interactions with how entire communities here seen in Dominica are impacted negatively. But this also gives the opportunity to build back better, sometimes elusive. We have young entrepreneurs, such as again in Dominica, this small um, fish processing and selling facility run by a cooperative that gives young people an entry into the industry and contributes to food security. In many places, fishing vessels double as water taxis and are used for transportation, both for locals and visitors. We have much of the foreshore in some cases being used as boat yards and boat haul out sites, particularly where the waters are rather treacherous. Women are prominent in the industry. We see cases, whether it is in gear supply, or we see cases in small scale vending that mixes um, fishery products with other goods and services to the consuming public. Much of this employs females, young and old, from all walks of life, with fishing households and without. More recently, we've seen upgrades of landing sites, this one from Barbados, in which there is a clear emphasis on the blue economy, which some fishing folk consider to be another potential threat of marginalization. But young people, you can see in the bottom, it provides an opportunity for learning, for getting into the fishery, for learning about innovation and new technology as young people are prone to do and hope for the future. We're hoping that a lot of this can come together next year in the Art International Year of Artisanal Fisheries and Aquaculture. And some of the themes that CERMES will be focusing on within the cross-cutting area of gender and youth include social resilience and social protection, innovation using internet and in um, communication technologies. And of course, what we just spoke about intersectoral linkages, all aimed at developing resilience. And of course, that includes a loving recovery from what we expect will be more um, perturbations, whether from natural hazards or from global events beyond the control of the fishery. So I've told you what you already know, and Sang is going to tell you a bit more, but in terms of the governance framework that we think holds some hope for how we can tackle this, not only in the Caribbean, but elsewhere in the world. Sanya. Thank you, Patrick. And good afternoon again, everyone. Thank you for joining today's session. My name is Sanya, and 
in this our final presentation this afternoon, I will present to you briefly on the instruments and arrangements that ought to be considered as critical to small, small scale fisheries governance and livelihoods in the Caribbean region. So I'll begin sharing that presentation with you now. All right. So getting right into it. When looking at policy in instruments that guide SSF or small scale fisheries at the regional level, there are at least four important instruments that we should consider and you should be familiar with. There is the 1995 Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, FAO, Code of Conduct for Responsible Fisheries. There's the Caribbean Community Common Fisheries Policy, as well as the Voluntary Guidelines for Securing Sustainable Small-Scale Fisheries in the Context of Food Security and Poverty Eradication, for short, known as the SSF Guidelines. Now, while the Common Fisheries Policy and the SSF Guidelines were both adopted for regional implementation in 2014, the process leading up to the Common Fisheries Policy was one that was in progress long before the establishment of these SSF Guidelines. And the Common Fisheries Policy was also adopted earlier in 2014. Therefore, there are elements of the SSF Guidelines, such as having a human rights-based approach to fisheries and gender that were not explicitly represented in the common fisheries policy. So in order to have a better alignment of both of these policies and to lend more support to their implementation in the region, a protocol to the common fisheries policy was developed and then adopted in 2018. In developing this protocol, a participatory approach was used whereby Fisher Folk were, had the opportunity to review and identify aspects of the SSF guidelines that they would want to be included for implementation in a regional policy. Aspects such as securing livelihoods as well as gender were considered essential to include in any SSF policy and those are reflected in that um, protocol. So when thinking about, you know, regional policies and their implementation, these regional policies can only truly be impactful and effective if there are mechanisms in place at the national level to support their implementation. This is where national intersectoral coordination mechanisms, or NICs for short, come into place. NICs are multi-sector, multi-stakeholder arrangements that link national to regional policies and processes. And NICs are based on a set of good governance principles. An ideal NIC has features such as being, um, such has features such as um, a comprehensive inclusion of stakeholders, having an environment where stakeholders are encouraged to become leaders and champions. NICs also facilitate the necessary bilateral national to regional linkages for governments and governance. So by definition, NICs play a key role in ocean governance and can be considered, you know, permanent parts of a, a regional governance framework. Because of the multi-level and multi-stakeholder links within NICs, they can also facilitate uh, the implementation of an ecosystem approach to fisheries, as well as ecosystem-based management. In terms of examples of NICs, there can be various types of NIC arrangements, and it can be a fisheries advisory committee or a council, it can be an ocean governance committee, a climate change or biodiversity committee. So there is flexibility in terms of the types of NIC arrangements that can um, be established and do exist. In terms of guidance and the operationalization of NICs and where they sit in terms of a governance framework, NICs operate within a system of policy cycles. So on the top 
right hand side of the screen the red circles that you're seeing there are the different policy cycles at the different level of governance from local right up to international or global and a policy cycle is an iterative or a repetitive process for decision making there are five stages of the policy cycle as you can see here at the top of the screen and once a problem has been identified data and information are gathered that data and information can then be analyzed and advice for decision making is given whatever decision is made can then be implemented and after implementation the entire process can be reviewed and evaluated to identify areas that you know need to be improved and where you might need to adapt so NICs carry out most, if not all, the stages of this policy cycle. And so it acts as that working arm, that operational arm that gets things done, that gets things going within a governance framework. NICs are, again, ideally good governance um, arrangements. So they're based on a set of principles that I would have mentioned earlier, and such principles include things as adaptability, transparency, accountability, inclusivity, equity as well as equality and these NIC arrangements also support stakeholder engagement and considerations are given to our ecosystem as well as human well-being and social outcomes such as such as our economies and livelihoods so NICs are essential arrangements for effective governance of our natural resources which of course includes fisheries Regional entities such as the OECS and CARICOM, as well as fisheries, regional fisheries bodies such as WACAPC, CRFM, and regional projects like the CLME Plus project and the OECS crop, just to name a few, have all identified NICS as being critical to the effective fisheries governance in the Caribbean region. SERMIs so alongside our regional partners, such as the Caribbean Network of Fisherfolk Organization, CNFO, the Caribbean Natural Resources Institute, Canary, and the CRFM Secretariat have been trying to identify and better understand the different types of NICs and how they function within the Caribbean region in order to better support their implementation and to improve how they function. In 2017, CERMES produced a technical report that offers guidance on how NICs function with a few examples and best practices. And an, and an update of these guidelines was done just, just last year in 2020. And both of these reports can be easily accessed on our website for you know, further information. So in closing, NICs are very important mechanisms for fisher folk to be engaged in because it is a national level avenue for fisher folk to influence policy and decision making through representation and advocacy. With fisher folk directly involved in NICs, there can be more support for implementing policy instruments such as the SSF protocol, that speak directly to fisher folk livelihoods, to gender equality, as well as equity. I know that um, Winsbert is now part of the Fisheries Advisory Committee in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and that was recently established. So that you know is a is a good move there, and we're looking forward to see good things coming out of of that sort of inclusivity of the fisher folk. So that ends my brief overview of SSF governance and the link to livelihoods. So if you need more information on what we all just spoke on today, you can visit our website, which is www.cavehill.uwi.edu slash SOMIS, or you can surely send us an email and request information on the work that we're doing here at CERMI. So thank you for listening. And I now hand the reins back over to you, Maria. Thank you, Sonia. Yes, this discussion on interactions in these NICs is surely very important and um, something that we definitely need to pay a lot of attention to. So we do have um, a couple of hands raised and what I will do is, um, I think I can allow persons to ask the questions. I saw initially Inga with her hand raised and Rabani. Um, just let me check. 
to see who else we have. And Sermi's team, if you could help me as well. Yeah, identify. I think you can start with those two. Um, okay. I asked people to keep their hands up and everyone took them down. So. <laughs> That's okay. Inga, so, I'm so. going to give you, I'm going to give you speaker privileges. You should be able to ask what uh, your question, if you still wish to. Once you unmute. Once you unmute. And Rabani, are you still interested in asking your question? You have speaker privileges, go ahead. Hi, how are you? Hi, Rabani, go ahead. Just unmute. I, I was hearing you just now, but you're muted again. Hi, um, uh, everything is okay with me. Where I am, I'm, I'm at the noisy area because of the flooding situation here. So I, I will not be able to contribute much in this discussion. Okay, all right. We were just wondering whether or not you'd had your hand raised to ask a question. And Inga said that um, it slipped her by mistake. So she raised her hand by mistake. No worries whatsoever. Um, Sylvia had had her hand up as well. Sylvia, did you want to say anything? Although I don't see her here anymore. No, so no more hands raised. Amina, any questions through um, YouTube? No, I'm not seeing any on there. Okay, all right. Well, well we can Patrick. talk amongst ourselves. <laughs> we can, <laughs> yes. We can even... Would you we can even ask the emeritus to talk. Uh, I mean, since we seem to be largely amongst friends, um, Robin Mahon, Professor Emeritus at Sermes, is amongst us. We had um, uh, Claire, oh my goodness, Claire from Grenada, another one of our colleagues and uh, a scientist over there. Any That's thoughts? Strategic. Do you want to leave that discussion, Patrick? Sure, if anyone will, will ask a question or we can <laughs> begin talking about things we already know about, um, again, such as the, the notion of intersecting uh, sectors um, really is not given sufficient attention, one would think, in the Caribbean, uh, although people give it lip service to talk about um, more fish in hotels, for example, but the import food bill for tourism is quite large, um, often based on price or on luxury products. So often it is that uh, fish is traded, but not necessarily on the domestic market to hotels beyond a certain amount and, mm. and in specific quantities. So linkages with fisheries and tourism, anybody game for that? Well, Patrick, I'm here listening. I mean, there's not a lot I can say, Robin, here, Robin Mahan, um, in as much as I am fully on board with, with, with this issue of, of connectedness at the national level and getting the sector working together and so forth. I'm surprised that we haven't heard anybody, or maybe I came in a bit late, but there's a, such a big connection, too, between the coping with the sargassum problem that is impacting fishers and tourism. Um, so I just wanted to throw that one in the pot. I wouldn't say a great deal about it, but I mean, it seems there's, had we had, we had as, as good connectivity between the sectors as we know is needed, uh, one, I just can't help wondering whether the, the way that we responded to sargassum in all our countries might have been a little bit more um, connected and supportive. Just a thought. Yeah, it's interesting, Robin, because even I had left a session 
another session in which CIRME's colleagues are participating that dealt exactly with that, the uh, sargassum. And the last speaker I heard was um, from the Punta Cana group in the Dominican Republic talking about the link between sargassum and tourism, although he did not invoke fisheries and other coastal uses very much in, in what I was able to hear before I left for this. Um, but interesting connections to be made. Any others? I see a hand up. Elder. Yeah, we have a hand up. So this is Winsbert. Winsbert, all you need to do is unmute. And you Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, Hello. good to go. Go ahead. Uh, I can um, join in late um, in the session to certain things, but I'm um, listening to the presentation and all the presentations. What I would like to speak about now is as a fisherman in dealing with the with the ocean because I experience um, the ocean every day of my of my life. And one of the things I'm noticing a lot is that we have to go further and further out to catch the mahi mahi and the kingfish. And many a times, sometimes we meet the fish and they are not eating. And we are uh, noticing a lot of um, the water color. Some, some brown, some green, and I think it plays a lot with the, the, the eating of the fish. I don't really know if the, the dolphin are feeding right now on the, on the sargassum weed. And one of the things we notice as well, too, since the sargassum has come to the shows, is that it brings a lot of juveniles, but it, we saw a lot of a profitability um, for the last two years ago, but this year we saw a decline now. With the, the with the fish that come with the the sargassum because early on in the in 2018 2019 you had a lot of the armor jack and you had a lot of small dolphin but from 2020 now to 2021 the sargassum weed are coming through now and we are not seeing that fish that used to come early on come with the sargassum weed so it it really making a very serious impact in, 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 the, in the fishing now. It, 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 it hung up the, the, the catching. I think the, the landings are now um, dropped. And what we fishers have to do now is do, move into fish aggregated device, which is the FAD. And one of the things that we're talking about too with um, fishing and, and tourism, I think one of the things is that um, it's a good linkages in terms of um, the market, the market side of things, where a fisherman could go to to the tourism to the hotels and get his fish sell. But the other side is that the, the tourism sector get more priority over the, the fishery sector. And and I think uh, we need to see how we could have a a, a, a better collaboration between uh, both uh, ministry, uh, both side because uh, both side need each, each other. And I think we ain't really seen that much where we ask asking the fishers now if they, they could do crafts with, the, with the, the, the waste fish that could sell to the tourism um, persons. But with the pandemic around now, we're seeing both markets have been, um, been affected so much because now um, the fish that we used to take to the, to the hotels are now closed. The hotels are closed. We can't do much business. And the fish is not really um, running. But see, the question I really got in my close-up is that, um, one of the things I keep and fishers keep asking me is um, how come the, the, the fish is not biting? I don't know if it's the, the temperature of the water and it's something that's really um, getting to me as well too because sometimes we meet the fish and it ain't really um, eating and we find that the new set of sagas on weed that is coming through now is not coming with that armor jack and that much dolphin. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for that, uh, Winsbert. Um, as we often say in fisheries, there are often more questions than answers. Some of those answers may be coming from the water in the south as um, the great rivers from South America also bring some of those um, waters that are less saline and different color um, and lenses that travel the entire Eastern Caribbean chain. Um, so, I think there are lots of questions at a sub-regional and regional level um, to be answered in terms of this interaction between lives and livelihoods and um, how we proceed with intersectoral linkages. 
But I think we're near our time. I don't know if you want to wrap up, Maria, and take us away. We can sure do that, although we did start a couple of minutes late. Um, I don't know if there are any, any comments from the floor. Any more last questions? Hi, Sanya here. I, I had one for just a quick curiosity question for Winsford. You know, you brought up a lot of good um, areas that need to be discussed and you're now a member of the Fisheries Advisory Committee. I just wanted to know if you're having these level of discussions in that forum. I know it's a new committee, but I'm also interested in knowing, you know, if, if the, these are the types of the things that you're discussing at that level. And there's also the National Ocean Governance Coordinating Committee. Are you aware of if these discussions are happening there because tourism and all the other sectors are well represented um, in that committee as well? Um, well, we had we we first meeting just before the um, the the volcano went in eruption, and I think we did not meet. Um, we did not have another meeting, but these are the kind of discussion I'm looking to take to the committee to see how best we could have these linkages in terms of the tourism and the fishery sector working in collaboration to move things forward. So um, the reason why I'm so speak about it is because these are some of the areas I'm so interested in and um, the fishers that keep um, coming and asking these, um, these kind of questions. And being on that committee now, it really gives me the opportunity now to raise it more and to see if I could get the, um, the government now to buy in, uh, buy in into, the, into the discussion and to see if now they could reach and have more um, involvement and more information sharing with the fishers. Because one of the things that does happen to is that we the fishers do share information and data, but what we are not getting back is results back to us and this is a this is really true of the fishers but i will take some of all the concern that fishers had and that was never being highlighted at a top level and carry it to that um committee when we do have an next board meeting excellent sounds good happy to hear it all right well great so everyone i just wanted to thank you all very much for joining us for the past hour. Um, so special thanks coming from myself, Amina, Sonia, Mia, and Patrick. Um, also very much thankful to TBTI for giving us the opportunity to organize and host this session. We really do love working and partnering with TBTI. Uh, but most of all, very special thanks to all of the Fisher folk who were involved in those video productions that you would have seen. It's so very important that you share your experiences, your lives and your livelihoods with, with many people. So without any further ado, everyone, thank you very much for joining us. Um, remember that we have this World Ocean Week continuing. Uh, there are many very nice sessions that are planned. So please choose your, your favorites and join. I'm sure TBTI will be looking forward to hosting you. Goodbye and thank you from all of us. Goodbye, be safe out there. Goodbye, everyone. Goodbye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.